So, welcome back from the break. I hope you're still alive and ready for our session about the HTML5. Who I am, you already heard, so you can skip that. The agenda, I will give you a short introduction to HTML5 and some of its new features. Then we will hear something about the vulnerabilities and threats which these new features introduce. And of course, we talk about the countermeasures, which you should do. Then we will see two demos, one quick demo about web workers. Then we will try to crack a hash in JavaScript Cloud. So if you have a laptop here with the internet connection, you can join us. And a short demo about cores. So, a little bit about the history of HTML5. HTML5 is uh, the successor of HTML4 and XHTML. Um, the standard is mainly driven by a group of uh, browser manufacturers, while W3C was still working on XHTML2. Later on, they also participated in the development of HTML5, but they maintained their own version of it. So, current state is still a living standard, so some facts or details may already have been slightly changed. A lot of browsers already support HTML5 to a certain degree, so if you want to know how compatible your browser is with HTML5, you can go to this website and have a look. This example is uh, Google Chrome which is currently the most supported browser for HTML5. <coughs> so, here is a short overview of all the features we will discuss. First, we will have a look at the cross-origin resource sharing. So, this allows to do cross-origin domain uh, requests. And we will talk about web storage, another form of storing data on the client. Then we have a talk about offline web application, just another form of caching. Then we will see the web messaging, so what's best web messaging? That's the new option for communication between iframes of different domains. Then of course we will have a look at the custom scheme content handlers, which allow web applications to register themselves, for example, as the main link. Then, quick information about the Geolocation API and the uh, web workers. Good. Let's start. First, we start with the cross origin resource sharing. So, traditionally, it's not allowed for JavaScript loaded from domain E to make requests to domain B. If I talk about requests in this presentation, I always talk about the XML HTTP requests, so the HX request. The same origin policy forbids to make such requests. But now with HTML5, this policy is relaxed. So a new feature called cross origin resource sharing is introduced, which allows you <coughs> to make cross domain requests. To make that possible, a new HTTP header was introduced called uh, Access Control Allow Origin Header. Using that header, domain B can tell from which domain he accepts requests. Here is a short example about these headers. So this example is a request from domain A, a JavaScript loaded from domain A, doing a request to domain B. So this is the response from domain B. He allows domain A to do the request. So where are the problems? Imagine the attacker is outside of a corporate network, hopefully. Uh, he could attack your internal website if the internal web server has this, this, this allow origin header 
configured roaming. So he could access internal websites via an employee's browser. Second problem, even if the internal web server configures the header correctly, it's still possible to scan the internal network for valid domain names. This is possible, this attack is based on the response time of this course request. Another main problem, of course, is that now requests are immediately sent to the foreign domain. Chorus just protects the response from being read. So this enables an attacker to use a victim to remote attack other servers. It's also, if you're familiar with cross-site request forgery, you can imagine it's now much easier to exploit cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities because you can use now the external HTTP object, object and use POST as well. And in an extreme case, it's possible to establish a remote shell to the victim's browser. We'll see that later on in a, in a nice demo. Good, next feature is the web storage. The web storage is just another form of storing data at the client. So previously you used cookies, of course. The cookies have a lot of uh, limitations, so it's just possible to store 4 kilobytes of data. And cookies are sent to the server with every request. HTML5 introduces a new kind of local storage, which allows you to store about 5 megabytes of data. And the data can be easily accessed by JavaScript. The problems with that feature is more or less the same as before. It's just another possibility. If a, if a developer stores the session identifier in the local storage, instead of the cookie, it's possible to steal the session ID in the storage as well. Of course, it's, it needs the cross-site scripting on a bit. But the problem is that there is no such feature as the HTTP-only flag, which forbids JavaScript to access the data. Second problem is if the developer stores sensitive data, let's say passwords, credit card, whatever, it can easily be read via JavaScript and it could be stolen. User tracking, it's an additional possibility to identify a user if you store a unique identifier in the local storage, it stays persistent on the system. Then other attack vectors can be stored persistently in the victim's browser. Depends on the attack, of course. Next feature is the offline web application. The offline web application allows web applications to store themselves completely offline. So previously it was difficult to create a web application which works completely without connection to the internet. Now you can define a file called cache manifest where you can define which resources need to be stored offline. The big difference is now you can store the root directory as well and you can store HTTPS connections. So this makes cache poisoning vulnerabilities more, more effective. And as well, it's uh, another possibility to store persistent attack vectors. Um, user tracking is as well a problem. You could store unique identifiers along with the cached application. Here is a quick overview of such a cache poisoning attack. So we have a malicious access point. Let's say the victim is in an unsecured network, like here, public, public Wi-Fi. He does a request to anydomain.com, and the attacker owns the access point, so he can intercept the requests. The attacker intercepts anydomain.com request, makes the request, 
and includes with the response a nice ray by <coughs> Firefox.com. Sorry, Philip. <laughs> um, the, the browser of the victim makes a hidden request to FirefoxSolution.com, which again is intercepted by the attacker who includes this cache manifest file and adds his own response. So this request to solution.com is now stored as an offline web application. If the victim goes home or in his office, he feels safe, he's in his trusted network, and he goes to solution.com, he does not one single request to the internet, all the data is loaded from his cache, including the malicious JavaScript from the attacker, which then would steal, for example, the username and password. So to hide the cache, of course, the attacker could do the correct login afterwards and send the real response from Firefox. Good. Next feature, the web messaging. That was completely new for me as well. This allows iframes from different origins to communicate to each other. This takes place completely at the, in the browser of the victim or the model normal user. The problem is you could steal sensitive data if such a message is accidentally saying, sent to a malicious iPhone. The other problem is it completely expands the attack service from the server to the client. So, for example, a malicious iframe could send malicious JavaScript content to other iframes where it's executed in the context of the site. This, of course, needs input validation on the client itself, so input validation on the server alone is not only sufficient. <coughs> the custom scheme and content handler is the possibility to register an application as a protocol handler like Mailtool, for example. If the user clicks add application, what they usually do, it's possible then to steal confidential data because the attacker clicks on the main tooling, is, it is re redirected to the attacker's page where he enters his email and of course the attacker can steal this information. Then again, it's another possibility for user tracking. You, could, you can store unique identifiers along with the, uh, the content handler. The WebSocket API over here, that's also completely new. This allows an HTTP connection to be upgraded to a full duplex TCP IP channel. This is uh, initiated by a JavaScript call in the browser. And uh, the reason for that is that in the past, you need to have asynchronous communication, you usually use AJAX, and AJAX requests have a significant overhead because the HTTP headers need to be included in every request and response. These full duplex WebSocket connections just have an overhead of two bytes. The problems are, it's in some cases it could be used for cache processing. <laughs> Imagine we have a proxy which doesn't understand the WebSocket handshake. It could include a response which is then cached on this proxy. This is very specific and it needs a vulnerability in this proxy. But there is a proof of concept for such an attack. Then again, it's another possibility to scan the internal network. Now it can be used as a port scan. And last but not least, it's possible to establish a remote channel. Yeah, the geolocation API is the 
possibility to identify the physical location of a, of a user. <coughs> it, it's usually used by uh, companies to serve the user based location based uh, services. But again, it can be used for user tracking, you know, the location of the user. So we could, if the user is registered, <coughs> track the physical movement profile or the anonymity of the users are completely broken, so anonymizer as like Tor can be bypassed. The web workers, a very interesting feature. Web workers provide the possibility for JavaScript to run in the background. This is not possible before. Your browser would freeze if you do a lot of work in JavaScript. Now with web workers you could do that. But web workers alone are not a security issue. But it's very powerful if you combine them with other HTML5 features or vulnerabilities. Here, web workers alone, it's just a feature, but it could, it could be used for cracking hashes in the JavaScript cloud. You see that afterwards. And web workers combined with cross origin resource sharing. You get a very powerful distributed denial of service attack. If you put that all together with web sockets, you could establish remote shells with multiple clients at the same time, and this results in a web based problem. So let's check the countermeasures. Unfortunately, it's not possible to mitigate all the problems just through server-side implementation. And you can imagine since all the most of the HTML5 features are based on JavaScript, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities become universal. So it's the same old story to input validation and encode your output. Here we can do something about cross-origin resource sharing. You should, if used, you should limit the allowed domains using the, this header. But you should never set it to asterisk, of course, but because then you open, you open for all the requests from the web. And do not base access control based on the origin header, of course. And to mitigate distributed denial of service attacks, your buff should block the course request if they arrive in a high frequency. This would be difficult to achieve, but it's an option. The web storage, of course, use cookies for your sessions. Do not store sensitive data in the local storage. And the web messaging, you should limit the target in your post message or the iframe which sends the message should send it just to one specific domain which you specify. On the other hand, the receiving iframe should not accept such mess messages from every iframe. You should know from which iframe you get the message. And they need to be validated on the client to avoid malicious content being executed. So these features, as already said, these features, there is not much you could do server side. Therefore, you need to train the user. They should not accept registration of protocol handlers. They should not accept to share the location information. They should not accept the caching of web applications. And again, they should clear the cache, including the local storage and the offline web applications. This is difficult because currently it depends on the browser manufacturer if just deleting all the cache is also deleting the local storage and offline web application. This is currently still not clear what is done on which browser. The risk of web sockets, the TCP IP communication, there is not much you could do, you could just disable it in the browser. Good, let's do something practical. Let's 
as tracking hash. So Raven is a small tool from Antlabs. It's a small proof of concept to demonstrate the power of web workers. So we will see there is a one browser window is the master who submits a hash in the cloud. The server is uh, coordinating all the client which get their work, their part of the work, cracking, 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 and send back to the result. So let's see if we get that to work. I'm using I'm using Firefox for the master. This is the page. I now submit the hash. And I don't know if some, someone will uh, would like to participate. You could. So be prepared to answer the URL. <laughs> so I submit this hash. It's an MD5 hash. I made it quite small to get the result in time. I limited the char set to just small small characters and numbers. I'm submitting the hash. Let's see if the input connection is still working. Okay, so the master is now waiting for uh, for clients to help him crack the hash. This URL you have to enter in the browser if you trust that. <laughs> So I trust them, I enter the URL in Google Chrome and can now start cracking. So I got now slot number one, just a bunch of hashes, just a bunch of uh, character strings to generate the hash. So we see now this is completely running in the background, the, the, the browser is not freezing and can still work. And we are tracking about 154,000 hashes per second. I don't know if someone already participated. Yeah, cool, good. How much do you have at the moment? Cool, then it will be quite fast so we can here on the master we see as well more or less how many ashes are cracked and that which slots are still open. And as soon one of the clients found the correct ash, it will be displayed. So it should be very quick. I made it with just one master, so let's see. This one is still running, yeah. Wait for the next update. It takes too long. We continue with the next. Okay, I guess we just because we just let him work. I show you the second demonstration. The uh, course requests. Therefore, I I switch to the VMware. So I use. Or maybe I have to show you another few slides to get a better understanding of the attack. So here, a simplified <coughs> demonstration of the attack. We will, as an attacker, look for a cross-site scripting vulnerability at the website. Then we will start the shell of the future on our server. We will include the cross-site, we will include the chart script of the vulnerability we found. And the browser gets infected, and his victims, uh, his browser can then be hijacked by the attacker. His browser is then completely remote control. So let's see. I'm using Chrome for the attacker and Firefox for the victim. So let's log in. The attacker is hacker twenty. 
let's look for a possibility for JavaScript. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Post a message here. Let's give it a try. Let's see. Uh, looks good. Let's read out the page. Okay. Classical cross site scripting vulnerability. So let's delete that again. And now we need to place the read attack stream. Here you can see it's just a script tag which is loading the real JavaScript down to the attack server which is then doing all the remote channel work, the communication to the server, the course request and everything. We don't go into that detail. So, the attack is placed. I'm logging off now from this block and shop community site. Now I'm starting the shell of the future. Just a quick and a small tool. It's running on the local interface at the port here. Now the attacker can use the, his own browser <coughs> to remote control the victim's branch. So he has to set the, his local proxy to the remote uh, to the shell of the future. Okay. Then he has a nice little console. Okay. So currently no victim is infected. Let's see, it changed now to Firefox. I'm the victim here. I'm logging in. Good. Hacker 10. Don't let you be confused. That's that's the victim. Just the username. I go to the Glocken friend page, see uh, Hacker 20, nice picture of a Bad guy, nothing else. So let's see what the attack sees. Ah, okay. We could now hijack this session. It just clicks on the link and he sees exactly the same as the victim. So you could now browse as the victim and can view the profile. I can post, hi, I'm the victim. So that's about it. And that's all possible because the attacker server is setting the allow cross origin header to allow connections. And then of course he can do connections to both to the to the site and to his own server. Good. Let's see what the cracking is doing. Ah good, finished. What do we have here? HTML5. I don't know who solved it, you or, or my browser, but yeah. That's about it. So we could do now a few questions or we could do the quiz if you already have some questions. <coughs> Maybe just a little bit. Um, now that do the expiring um, policies of the HTML page. Um, what is the effect on the offline storage and the, the cache applications? Yeah. It's a good question. It's uh, currently not in my... <laughs> I didn't check those details yet, but uh, yeah, that's certainly something you need to check if there are similar settings for offline web applications. Yeah. Okay, I see you ready for <laughs> For the whole thing, <laughs> Good, let's see what you what you know. Good. So let's start. Um, yeah, what, what could you do for um, reduce the risk of course? Uh -huh. Okay, I see. It's a good 
audience. <laughs> Let's check the new one. You don't have to shake all the time. It's, it's just it's enough to just shake once, and then you can answer questions for an hour. On the spot. On the spot. So where should I store in the, in the local storage? Okay, I guess they are too easy, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's so, <coughs> what messaging? It's a little tricky one.